Good evening. My name is John Charles. I am the uh, scientist in residence at Space Center Houston, and you're wondering why I'm here tonight, but I'm retired from NASA, and, and when I worked at Johnson Space Center, I worked for many decades for the guest of honor tonight. Uh, I'm gonna be your moderator for a few moments before we turn it over to our, our two distinguished uh, speakers. I want to just want to say welcome to uh, this event tonight. We're here to uh, discuss uh, the new book, uh, The Astronaut Maker, How One Mysterious Engineer Ran Human Spaceflight for a Generation. The book by Mac Michael Cassett on the far end of the, of the stage about Mr. Abbey, uh, right in the middle of the stage. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, such a good crowd is here tonight to uh, hear this discussion. And uh, we'll get right to that. First off, let me uh, sort of frame the discussion for the rest of the, uh, the hour about uh, why we're here. Uh, the, the topic, of course, is Mr. Abbey and his accomplishments uh, as the, uh, uh, in his many roles uh, at, uh, at NASA uh, over the course of, of many decades. Uh, Mr. Abbey, of course, uh, is currently a, a fellow in space policy here at the Baker Institute. Uh, before that, though, in his formative years, he was, uh, after his uh, time in the Air Force with uh, the Dinosaur Program and other uh, programs in 1976, he was the Director of Flight Crew, uh, Director of Flight Operations at Johnson Space Center. In 83, he became the Director of Flight Crew of the Flight Crew Operations Directorate. In uh, 1990, he became the uh, uh, Senior NASA Rep for the Synthesis Group, uh, charged with planning uh, strategies for returning to the moon and then going off to Mars. In 1991, he was appointed a senior director for space, uh, civil space policy of the National Space Council and the executive office of the president. In 1992, he became a special assistant to the NASA administrator. In 1994, he became the deputy director of the Johnson Space Center and was subsequently named the director of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, so at NASA, we describe this as a series of increasingly more responsible positions. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to, to uh, understand, and I think we will, as we discuss this later uh, during the rest of the afternoon, or rest of the evening, uh, the importance of, of that era of spaceflight and the importance of Mr. Abbey in shepherding and steering our progress in that era of spaceflight. And just as it took Nixon to go to China, we have Mike Cassett here to explain Mr. Abbey to us a little bit. <laughs> I tried to tie in a little bit of the diplomatic discussion here. Uh, Mike Cassett has a, an equally uh, illustrious uh, uh, resume. Uh, he was, uh, he's an American television producer, screenwriter, and author. And he has many notable TV works including The Outer Limits, Erie, Erie, Indiana, Beverly Hills, 90210, and The Twilight Zone. He's a, a writer of, of many science fiction and, and, and other kinds of short stories. Uh, but I am most uh, familiar with uh, Mike in his role as the explainer of directors of flight operations and directors of flight crew operations. It was only a scant 25 years ago that uh, the first book that changed my life came out, a book called Deke about Donald K. Slayton, who was NASA's first director of flight cooperations. You'll notice it's heavily annotated uh, by, my, by my notes. He followed that up by a... Uh, uh, with a book called We Have Capture about the, uh, the next major flight crew operations director, uh, Tom Stafford. <coughs> and you see it has uh, a few notes, uh, uh, many more notes uh, on the top here, but uh, these two books really pivotally explained, I think, the, the, the crew selection processes during the, the formative years of the space program. And he is so well, uh, I think, well uh, positioned to understand FCODs now that he actually wrote a book about, a fictional book, about uh, a fictional director of flight cooperations who we hope never actually appears in reality because the man had very interesting characteristics before he finally came to, I think, the, the creme de la creme, uh, the book we're here to discuss tonight. Uh, uh, very good treatment and an attempt, as well as anybody can, to explain to the rest of us in NASA what was really going on at the highest levels in NASA during the, the uh, 80s and 90s. So uh, I think with that, I, I have a, one additional announcement, and that is that there will be a reception after the, uh, the discussion here, and uh, also a book signing, and you are not allowed to have any of the snacks until you buy a book and get it signed. <laughs> so with that, I would like to uh, start the discussion here a little bit with uh, Mr. Abbey and, and Mr. Cassett, and then see where it goes for the rest of the hour. And I guess my... It's incumbent on me to ask the first question. 
<laughs> they're applauding me for sitting down. Hi, they're applauding you for the number of tabs in that deep book. <laughs> That's frightening. So I think uh, since we are here to talk about not just the man, but the book about the man, I'd like to ask uh, Mike uh, a question, and that is, uh, what inspired you to write a book about Mr. Abbey? Well, having written about Deke and written about Tom Stafford and followed human spaceflight since its beginning, um, I've always been fascinated by, in one sense, just the, who are the, who's the gatekeeper? Who gets to decide who goes into space? And um, Deke obviously was the one for the Apollo era, era and uh, um, I got to got interested as well in, in the Russians. Uh, you know, General Kamanin was the one who actually did it uh, for uh, <laughs> much of the uh, Soviet era, and, and uh, it just struck me that you know natural evolution would be uh, to see just who did it for the shuttle, who 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 selected the astronauts or supervised the selection, who set the standards, who made the decisions, but also just in getting to know and watch Mr. Abbey's career from uh, whatever mountaintop I was living on. Um, but then watching his, as his career progressed and seeing how central he was just to human spaceflight as we see it right now. So it was just, it, it became something that I just pursued because I wanted to know the answers myself. I wanted to ans answer the question that people say is, how did this gentleman get to be this gentleman? <coughs> And I think the correlate question of that then is, is for Mr. Abbey, uh, given the fact that you have a, a lot of accomplishments, you have a storied career, literally a storied career, what, what possessed you to let this guy write a book about you? <laughs> <laughs> he asks well, himself that. Well, I, uh, I was talked into it by Tom Stafford, who, uh, <laughs> and uh, Mike had written the book about Tom, and Tom, uh, got after me continually to uh, talk to Michael, so I finally broke down. <laughs> it was after he had, Tom Stafford had broken me down to write his life story, so there, is, there may be a, a constant thread in this, and I uh, apparently am being pressured to write Tom Stafford Volume 2. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's going to be about, but uh, I think it involves money. <laughs> So yeah, so George was very, very kind because I, yeah. I mean, it is. I actually had been in, in touch with Tom during his book, and we just got talking about NASA as it existed in you know, certainly the late '90s and early 2000s in the history, and and we just George's name would come up from time to time, and and I think I said over some several glasses of Chardonnay one night, it's like somebody should do this gentleman's biography, you know, and and Tom kind of looked at me and. You know, is that, that if you know Tom Stafford, you know that things go in and they come out uh, and things happen at some point. And, yeah. and that just kind of, you know, three years later, he says, you know, uh, he says, Mike, I've, I talked to George. I think he may be receptive. And, <laughs> it only took about another five years of, uh, yeah. of wheedling around to, uh, to insert myself into his life and, and th those of his, uh, that of his, uh, his family. So I first want to just thank you all for letting me uh, nose around and, uh, and in, in George's case, uh, take up many, many hours of, of his time. Well, in fact, I was going to ask, ask you that question. What was it like to, to try and, and penetrate this, this inscrutable life, the, the life that we've all been so curious about? And I speak as a, as a person who has been curious about what was going on at the highest levels of NASA, Johnson Space Center and elsewhere. What was it like to actually be able to pull the, the curtains back and, and see what was really going on? Well, the joke answer, partly true is, did I pull the curtain back? I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> the other is that, that I found that Mr. Abbey had a, a, a great deal of mythology about him. Some of you who worked at the Johnson Space Center or worked at NASA may be familiar with it. And I found that most of the mythology was, was literally that. It was about as, as valid as you know, tales of gods on Olympus. Yeah, it does not strike me as in, inscrutable at all, but rather uh, not only brilliant, but engaging, uh, uh, quite frank, quite open, quite sly, quite funny. Um, I guess it's like anything, you just, you know, hang out long enough and, uh, you know, people get comfortable and, you know, it wasn't like I felt I was, I was doing an interrogation with him at any time. It was just more, well, let's talk about 
talk about this set of events, these, you know, these circumstances, this mission, how did this happen, what, what, what led up, what, what went away. And I'm a storyteller. I mean, it's a phrase I hate to you know, just apply to myself, but I look at my career and that's, that's what it is. Primarily more a novelist than, than anything else. And so it just, he seemed like an interesting character. It's like, and as I said, it was like, how did he, how did he experience and live through all these things? Back to the Apollo fire, back to dinosaur, you know, the shuttle, all these, these events. How did he go through it? What was he thinking? And how did one lead to another to the point where he was, in essence, the most powerful individual in the history of human spaceflight before or since? <laughs> How do you follow up a statement like that with a, with a, <laughs> yes. with a meaningful question? <laughs> uh, anybody have any questions in the audience before I come up with yes. some more of my own? That was a good chance to ask them. Yes, please. Where does NASA keep the alien bodies? <laughs> <laughs> um, he would know. <laughs> but yeah, the, the alien, where, does, where does NASA keep the alien bodies? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're in a, a garage somewhere in Clear Lake. Yes. <laughs> that would be hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, uh, George it, it can speak to this. I mean, it, it's, it might be worth hearing him just <laughs> explicate on the, just the, the process of, of just talking to a relative stranger for all this time after years of basically not being in the press right. by choice or circumstance. I mean, did you, uh, did you find me intrusive, pesky? Um, feel free to lie. <laughs> uh, you mean as far as what, we're going back to the beginning? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah go back to the, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I was very fortunate because uh, I was uh, always uh, given opportunities and I uh, was always given an op a job that I enjoyed and I uh, was very blessed that way, and uh, fortunately, I had some uh, some great uh, teachers and leaders that I worked for, and uh, that made a difference. I think uh, it made a difference in my life because uh, I think uh, being able to uh, work for them and learn uh, learn from them it uh, helped me greatly as I as I uh, moved into other jobs through the agency and. Uh, into uh, into NASA headquarters and into the White House. So all those things, I think, uh, contributed. And I think, uh, as I say, I was quite fortunate to have some mentors like uh, George Lowe and Chris Kraft and Max Fajay and uh, Sam Phillips and Bob Gilruth. And uh, those were probably the great leaders uh, that really took us to the moon. and. Uh, enabled us to do what we have done really since since that time, and uh, uh, I think that again I was quite fortunate to be in those uh, be able to be there at, at that time and the right place at the right time I guess. Well, what I found in in discussing George's life and career and the life I mean not to to hustle the book because you're all here for that blessed reason anyway and and you'll either buy it, read it or not, but it is a, just a great family and human story. I mean, there's this wonderful immigrant background to the, the abbeys of Seattle and, and just, you know, how, how people are shaped by their experiences and by warmth and love and also discipline and ambition and, and uh, just following that, that story was actually just some of the most fun. I mean, as much fun as the NASA uh, stuff for me, just because it's it's just classic Ameri Americana. It's like a, you know, a Mark Twain story or something like that. So that was fun. But with, what struck me is, is at every stage of George's career, whether it was winding up at uh, the Naval Academy when the Naval Academy was not in your plans, or winding up uh, flying helicopters. I mean, just the, or winding up at NASA in the first place in 1964, then in, in many cases it was circumstance. It was not a case of, of a, a, a rigorous march or set of. <laughs> no, no I, I didn't plan it out. How was that? <laughs> yes. I, was saying, but, I mean, uh, the, the, the great story in there is you were planning to go to the University of Washington. Yes. And. <laughs> no, I, I, I was, uh, a lot of things just ended up happening because uh, they <laughs> happened. So I, I, uh, 
I ended up at the Naval Academy because I had an older brother that uh, insisted that I had to leave home. So, <laughs> <laughs> and if I'd gone to the University of Washington, uh, I would be living with my parents, and uh, he thought it was time for me to leave leave home. Yeah, so leave the nest. He, uh, so I got a cultural shock and went to the Naval Academy. <laughs> but uh, those were. Certainly uh, good years for me, and uh, it, uh, it turned out well, and it gave me the opportunity to get into aviation and fly, which I wanted to do, and uh, I was fortunate. I had a great career in the Air Force as a pilot, and then was able to go back to graduate school and uh, get into research and development, and, and then really uh, become involved in uh, one of the first space programs that the country was involved in, which was a Air Force program, the Dinosaur, which was much like the Space Shuttle, only it was much smaller. And uh, so I was uh, able to work on that program, and uh, it was canceled by uh, the Secretary of Defense, McNamara, and right before we started to get ready to fly, unfortunately. But a lot of the systems and the things that we do, did on Dinosaur carried over to the Space Shuttle, and so I was able to see years later that uh, all that did come to fruition and the space shuttle uh, really uh, gained from dinosaur and operated on the same principles and a lot of the subsystems a lot of the technology went into the heat protection system all came out of dinosaur so i had uh, that opportunity and had the opportunity to work with some great people from uh, the national Aeronautics and space administration on dinosaur and and then in later years, uh, I got sent to NASA uh, when uh, General Phillips was uh, made the program director uh, of the Apollo program and was looking for Air Force officers to uh, go to the three major NASA centers involved in Apollo, uh, the Johnson Space Center and the Kennedy Space Center and Marshall Space Flight Center. And I got called to uh, come for an interview here to the Johnson Space Center and uh, then ultimately got sent to uh, the Johnson Space Center, but <laughs> not necessarily voluntarily, but I got sent here <laughs> and uh, found it a great place to work and a great, great group of people to work with. And uh, I didn't really intend to stay, but a couple of years and then somehow it turned out I stayed longer. So. Yeah, yes. <laughs> kind of that extended the tour a little bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So it, uh, life has a way of uh, turning out that way for me. It doesn't always work out the way I'd planned it, so. Well, one of the uh, early, uh, I think, fortuitous events was working with George Lowe on yes. the Apollo uh, Control Board. Can you, can you talk about that? That's, that has got to have been one of the most intellectually stimulating and hardest stents I can imagine. Well, I think uh, we, had, uh, we, we had the, uh, unfortunate experience of the Apollo 1 fire in January 1967 and <clears throat> George Lowe came in as program manager uh, after the fire and uh, the end of the decade was coming up pretty quickly and uh, if we were going to land on the moon successfully before the end of the decade we didn't have a lot of time and so uh, George Lowe was a program manager and uh, he was very concerned on how to bring all the resources of the center to bear on the program and get everyone involved. And uh, I suggested uh, setting up a configuration control board where we would have all the directors of the centers as members of that board. And uh, we would really handle all the decisions, not just on the configuration, but any decision that really had to be made that, uh, would enable us to get to the moon by the end of the decade. So we uh, set up a board and we met once a week, every Friday. And uh, we also required that uh, the presidents of the companies that were involved in the uh, Apollo program at North American and Grumman, they had to attend in person in Houston every Friday. And uh, so, uh, he wanted me to develop the agenda for the meeting, so uh, every week I developed the agenda for the meeting. And I uh, came out with the agenda, uh, the topics we were gonna address on Monday, and 
everyone had from Monday to Friday to review that and uh, come up with uh, recommendations and presentations for the Friday session. And uh, that didn't give people a lot of time, and uh, they were not happy about that, but uh, we uh, nevertheless did it, and George Lowe supported me in doing that, and so I ended, ended up developing the uh, agenda every Monday and getting it out, and then every Friday we would go through it, usually uh, well into uh, the evening, and uh, address every, every subject and make a decision and then move on. And then once a, once a month we would uh, go to the contractor's facility and we'd go to Los Angeles for, to meet with uh, at North American and then we'd go meet all day there and then uh, we'd go to Grumman or go to Grumman first and then go to, go to uh, Los Angeles for North American. So we'd spend a full day at uh, Grumman going through the, again the decisions and bringing everyone on the program together in one place to, so everybody was a part of what we decided. And uh, that was, uh, I think, certainly a good way to do it and uh, was very significant uh, that we were able to really make everyone feel a part of the program. And uh, I think uh, that was George Lowe's intent and uh, he was very successful in doing that. And uh, I think uh, we were able to address the issues uh, because a lot of people would rather study an issue than bring it, rather bring it, than bringing it forward. And then when they would bring it forward, uh, it wouldn't be the answer that uh, George Lowe and the other leaders were looking for. So it was far better to bring a problem in, uh, even though they weren't really ready to present it, because that way they could get really the, the uh, direction that they needed to have to come up with the right answer. So we acted that way and uh, did it that way. and. I think that uh, accelerated uh, getting the answers and enabled us really to get to the point that we could land on the moon by the end of the decade. And then uh, George Lowe, of course, uh, and uh, we had had the fire in, North in January 1967 and uh, we had to understand what caused the fire. and. Uh, and then uh, really, since uh, we had a lot of flammable material in the, in the crew compartment, we had to develop materials that didn't burn in 100% oxygen, and just about everything burns in 100% oxygen. So we had a major program developing non-flammable materials, and we were able to do that, and then test those materials and prove that they didn't burn in 100% oxygen, and then fabricate all those materials into spacesuits and whatever we needed to put in the crew compartment. So that all went on from January until we were ready to fly in uh, October of 68. And uh, at the uh, same time, we had to design a quick opening, outward opening hatch because part of our problem in losing the crew was it was an inward opening hatch and they couldn't remove it. And so we did a major design of the hatch and other systems on the spacecraft to really make it uh, reliable enough so we could get have a high assurance of getting to the moon successfully. So we did all that and we were ready to fly the first manned flight of Apollo in October 1968. And uh, George Lowe went on vacation, uh, probably his first vacation in about a year and a half, uh, took a couple of days off in August and he came back and concluded, he, uh, he told me that we're not gonna get to the moon by the end of the decade if we stay on the same program. So we need to do something different. And uh, he came up with the idea that if Apollo 7 was successful, the next flight of Apollo, the second flight, manned flight, would go to the moon, which was uh, really a major change of direction. And uh, he was able to convince the NASA leadership that that was a good approach. and. Uh, the administrator, Jim Webb, didn't want to announce that. He wanted to wait and see if Apollo 7 was really successful, and it turned out that it was. And uh, so we, uh, two months after Apollo 7, did the Apollo 8 mission, which really was a major stepping stone in getting us to be able to do Apollo 11. And uh, the other big problem on Apollo 8 was you needed a Saturn V, and at that point, the Saturn V had flown two flights, 
the first flight had been fairly successful, and then the second one uh, turned out to be a major problem when it flew in the spring of 1968. And uh, we had major pogo problems, vibration problems in the first stage, and two of the second stage engines shut down. <clears throat> and the third stage engine, which you needed to restart to get to a, on a trajectory to the moon, didn't restart. And the spacecraft limb adapter structure around where the lunar module was came apart in flight. So at the same time we were getting everything ready for manned flights, we had to solve all these, all these uh, booster problems and get them ready. So after that, that, fair, that uh, problem, that problem flight in the spring of 68, <clears throat> the next time we flew the Saturn V, we flew a crew to, to the moon and that worked worked successfully and, and then from there we uh, proved out the lunar module in Apollo 9 and then did Apollo 10 two months later. Each month, each flight was done two months after the other and uh, Apollo 10 was a dress rehearsal for the lunar landing and that was very successful. We didn't land but we went through all the phases that we would except for the actual landing and then uh, Apollo 11 occurred in July, two months later, and then we uh, had achieved our goal of getting there by the end of the decade. But again, that was, uh, that was leadership that brought us there. Uh, people like George Lowe and Chris Kraft and Max Fajay and Sam Phillips and uh, Bob Gilruth, they, the, they were the ones that were leading the way. And uh, that, that really uh, gave us the capability to do it. And, I was very fortunate to be a part of it and uh, learn from them. Let me ask a, a question, and just for the context, I, I assume everybody here is not as well versed as, as some of us space nerds are about the, the details of the history. From the first Mercury flight until the, uh, the Apollo 11 landing was eight years. That's the same amount of time it's been since the space shuttle last flew and have been preparing for the next uh, human American human space flight. So, and that, that eight years, that included all the Mercury flights, all of the Gemini flights, the uh, first several Apollo flights, plus major disasters, the Apollo fire, the, the, the second Saturn V almost coming apart during its test launch. And the, this generation of engineers and, <clears throat> and, and planners and scientists were confident enough in, the, in what they knew and how the, they knew how to do it, that they could say, yeah, we got this. Yeah, it's, it, it looked bad on the second Saturn V, but we're good enough, we're comfortable enough to put people on the third, the very next Saturn V down the line. How did it feel, and here I am asking the, the news reporter TV personality question, how did it feel to you to be in the situation where you knew that the last time a Saturn V flew, it would have aborted, but you were gonna have people on the next Saturn V to launch? Well, I think uh, you were apprehensive. <laughs> 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 well, you, you, you know, you try to be uh, very thorough and, and fix all the issues and problems uh, on, a, on a rocket or a spacecraft and then uh, test them and prove them and satisfy yourself that you really uh, resolve those issues and uh, do everything you can to make sure that the risk is as low as you can make it but it's always there, and uh, so uh, you're still apprehensive as you go through each of the phases of flight until your six is successfully completed, and uh, and then really don't relax until the mission's over, <coughs> and you've got the crew back on the aircraft carrier, and so you your mission uh, starts off, and you're. Uh, you're with it every uh, every step of the way, and and uh, following to make sure that you really get through that phase and on to the next one, <coughs> and then uh, you can relax once they come back. One thing that I was struck, I mean, in, <coughs> in telling George's story was not only the the mentors he had had because they're it's fabulous people, most of them still largely unknown to the American public and shouldn't be, although George Lowe is getting a biography that'll be out in the next year and mm. Sam Phillips should follow and Max Figet. Are, are you writing him? Uh, yeah, not, <laughs> not, not me. I've, I've, I've seen, seen the, the, the mountaintop here. How, how can I <laughs> go on? Uh, but what was, what was also interesting to me as part of the story is the, the lessons that George 
learned and uh, probably taught as well as part of the Configuration Control Board. He applied later as head of the Johnson Space Center, uh, the infamous uh, station development and operation meetings mm -hmm. that of, of fond memory to probably some people here, perhaps not fond memory uh, of some, but just the, the whole principle of you have to get people who, you have to have a rigorous schedule, you have to push people, you have to you know, meet, especially when people don't necessarily want to because then they won't linger. You have to uh, <laughs> have the people who can make a decision and you have to force them to make it there or go away. And that's the only way, it seems to me, that big projects get done successfully and remotely on time. It almost sounds like you're making a plea for doing the, that, that sort of thing nowadays so we can see more progress. Would you? I'm not a space professional. I couldn't possibly suggest such a thing. <laughs> but what, do you, some, what do you think, Mr. Abbey? Could, could it be done that way today? Well, I think it would be very difficult to do it in the environment that we've got today. Uh, we were fortunate we had uh, we had great leadership in the Congress, and uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, both parties were supportive of the program, and we had a Congress that I think really uh, were very dedicated to the program, and the administration certainly was dedicated as well. But as I say, we're blessed with the leadership, and uh, uh, leaders just don't happen. They, they, they come up, uh, and they learn from their mentors. And if you look at the background of people like George Lowe and Bob Gilruth and Chris Kraft, they came out of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was a hands-on organization that did things and gave them the opportunity to learn. And they had failures and problems, but they learned. And uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was uh, focused on aeronautics and really provided the research and the technology and understanding that went into all our airplanes, both our commercial airplanes and our military airplanes. And if you look at uh, the history, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, uh, it's a great history. And so you developed a, a, a cadre of leaders out of that organization. And when they were melded into NASA, they carried over that thought process and understanding that they'd been brought up with and carried it over into NASA. And that carried us through until those people started retiring. And then it changed because NASA had not done a good job of developing the future leadership and giving them the opportunities that had existed in uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And so you, if you're gonna be successful, it's a, you have to have the, the, the people with the backgrounds, the education. Education is a part of it. And having young people going into engineering and science is a part of it because we were fortunate during Apollo that we were able to get that kind of a uh, commitment from young people uh, because of Sputnik, uh, because of Yuri Gagarin's flight in 1961. The Congress put a lot of money into supporting engineering and scientific education for young people and so they could go to school. And so you had uh, you gained the benefits of those young people as they came into the agency, and then you had the benefit of the leadership. And uh, that, that all going together really uh, gave you the capability to move forward. And then having a Congress that was supportive and an administration that was supportive. And uh, if you look at the elements today, uh, I saw on television the other night uh, the top priorities, problem areas in the country. Education wasn't listed as one, and yet education, I think, is critical to it all. And it was critical to the successes we achieved, not only in Apollo, but what we've done since then. And it will be critical in the future. And yet we, we don't seem to really recognize the importance of education. When you have a city the size of Houston, and you're graduating less than 50% of the students from high school, let alone the, that remainder going on to college, and what remain of that remainder that goes into engineering and science. And in the state of Texas, you graduate less than 50% of the young people from, from high school. And again, how many of those go into college and how many go into engineering and science? And that's probably true across the United States. It's not unique to Texas. And uh, this nation has a major problem with education, and we need to address it. Yeah.
We have a question. She, she said you, you led NASA's hiring of women as astronauts, uh, and including Sally Ride as the first uh, woman on the space shuttle. Yes. What challenges did you encounter uh, bringing women into the program? Well, I think uh, at that point we didn't have any women astronauts, and so there were, uh, was a lot of resistance that I encountered from people that uh, were focused on male astronauts. So. Uh, uh, it was important, I think, to recognize that we had uh, really greatly qualified women engineers and scientists. And when we started out in the program uh, with Mercury, having a background as a test pilot was probably a good requirement. And uh, women didn't have that kind of background. So the initial phases of the program, you were focused on getting uh, those kinds of individuals with that background. But with a space shuttle, you could really uh, look at opening up the, uh, the astronaut corps and to giving opportunities to others. And uh, there were a lot of well-qualified women and minorities out there that really uh, should be considered and were considered and we were able to bring into the program. And uh, so the selection we had in 1978 was uh, one of the first selections we'd had in a long period of time and it was a, selection that really was based on supporting the shuttle. And uh, you had to have people that had fly, flying experience to pilot the shuttle, but there were mission specialist astronauts who didn't have to be pilots. And they uh, just needed to have an engineering or science background and be able to work well as a, uh, as a member of a team and, and uh, perform well in space. And uh, women could do that just as well as the men. And, so we opened the program up and we were really fortunate to find some outstanding young women to come into the program and Sally was one of six that we selected in 1978. And since then we've selected others. If you also go back to the control center, uh, 50 years ago we were uh, flying our Apollo missions and there wasn't a woman in the control center. And now today if you go out to the Johnson Space Center and look into the, into the control room there that's operating space station, you'll see probably there's more women and men on the consoles and you have a woman flight director. Yeah. And uh, that's a great thing. And I think uh, we uh, have moved forward and I think with the problem of young people not going into engineering and science, the thing that's really enabled this country to keep going is the fact that we've had qualified women going into engineering and science and becoming astronauts. And I think that's a great thing, and uh, I think we need to ensure that we keep that, that relationship there and keep it going. Good evening, sir. Certainly you served your country very well. If I want to ask you, countries like Japan, they have high value in uh, education and technology. And then we have a country like, we had a country like Soviet that they had much bigger resource than perhaps any other countries. Why these two nations couldn't do what you guys did? Or as perfect as you guys did? Yeah, what, I guess the question sort of is, what's, what is unique about America in the 60s that was able to do this when other countries then and now had resources comparable to what America did then? Why do you think there was, it was unique to, to America and maybe the Soviet Union to undertake that effort. Well, I think the, uh, the program when it initially got started was a competitive program between two countries that had a lot of technical and uh, scientific capabilities. And uh, I think uh, the Soviet Union gained a lot from uh, the uh, German scientists that came over to Russia after World War II and they uh, put a lot of effort into developing rockets in Russia and uh, they had an individual in Russia that was a very competent engineer uh, named Korolev and uh, Korolev 
had a vision for space and had a great understanding of uh, spacecraft design. And you put all that together and they had a great capability. And we here in this country also, I think, uh, had that kind of a capability. We had a long, strong, t strong technical, technical capability and manufacturing capability that we came out of World War II with. And we also gained from uh, the German rocket experience and uh, had Werner von Braun and his team here in this country. So I think that put the United States and the Soviet Union really in a, in a key position or allowed them to really pursue activities in space. And uh, that kind of capability didn't exist probably in other countries. Uh, other countries had, I think, certainly well-qualified engineers and scientists, but they didn't have the overall support and funds that were available in countries like the United States and the Soviet Union to pursue space. But they were here, and, and uh, I think the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, spurred that kind of development, at least in the initial phases. And I think the great thing about the space program and about Apollo, when we started out, there was a competitive thing between the two countries. And I think what's happened now and what's happening here as we sit here this evening, the International Space Station is flying over us and it's an international program. And uh, other countries have become a part of the program. And on Space Station, you've got Europe, you've got Japan, you've got Russia, you've got Canada, and uh, China has certainly got great capabilities, and we ought to start working with them as we are working with the Russians, and India as well. So there are a lot of countries around the world that I think uh, have developed the capability, and they've gained that knowledge from both the Soviet Union, Russia, and the United States. And I think the great thing about it is now we're working together in space instead of just having the two nations competing. And I think when we go back to the moon and go beyond that, uh, hopefully we'll continue to do that together and uh, not do it as separate nations. No, one, the, 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 let's, let's go ahead and line up at the mics if you have questions, okay? Go ahead. Uh, in the documentary Fight for Space, Jim Lovell invoked the fable of the tortoise and the hare when comparing the American and Russian approaches to manned spaceflight, with Roscosmos taking a slow and steady approach to starting and maintaining programs, while NASA has had a somewhat all or nothing approach of pursuing highly impressive, yet highly expensive programs. Are commercial companies the solution to ensuring that NASA doesn't go through another eight year dry spell in manned spaceflight, or does a program like the SLS still have its place? Did you get that? No. <laughs> Comparing the, the slow and steady pace of the Soviet Union and the Russians versus the, the, the more hare-like, the more rabbit-like uh, approach of, of the Americans going very fast, then, then waiting, and then going fast again. Uh, he's asking, is, is there a, a, a role for the commercial sector in the long term in, in developing space flight? And which model do you think would be more successful commercially? Did I get that more or less right? Well, um, uh, certain people have raised the fact that uh, the SLS is um, a non-reusable design oh, yeah. as it stands currently. Also, the, is there a role for the space launch system and the Orion capsule in, in future space exploration? That's for you. <laughs> Everything well, you say is. I think that. Uh, the space launch system is a very expensive, uh, a very expensive rocket, and uh, at best, it's going to be able to fly. If it flies, it's going to fly maybe once or twice a year, and it's never going to be able to build up the reliability to put humans on it that you really need to do. And I think you're fortunate right now. We're fortunate to have companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are developing rockets that have. A, good capability, the capabilities that we really uh, could use, and they can build them much cheaper. And rather than have the government invest these massive amounts of money in a vehicle like the Space Launch System, uh, we would better serve to go ahead and use these other, other rockets and capability. Orion is a, uh, one of three capsules that the United States is building. 
The United States is paying for three capsules, capsules like we flew back in the 1960s, and they aren't as good as a capsule we flew on a, to the moon, and yet we're building three of them, and I don't know why you need three, and none of them have a capability to do assembly in space. You couldn't build a space station again uh, because we don't have a space shuttle, and none of these three capsules have a capability to do EVA or assembly in space. And so you have to really say, what, what are we really spending our money on? I think there's a lot of money available to, to NASA, but you gotta spend it the right way. And I think we could get to the moon pretty quickly if we started rethinking how we're using the money, and again, do it working with other countries. And as far as whether we're on the right track now, uh, they talk about the Lunar Gateway. Well, God gave us a space station called the moon and you don't build a space station to orbit a space station, and that's what we're doing. And there isn't money to do it. So you need to really rethink where we're going and, and uh, go, go the right way. Everything you do should be building on what you've done. It should be the foundation for the next step. And right now, the, uh, there's a shuttle, shuttle flying. It's, show, it's being flown by the DOD. The X-37 has been flying for a number of years. And you could scale it up and uh, make a smaller shuttle, and yet we're building three capsules. And uh, yet that, that, that vehicle is available right now. It's flown for the last five years and lands successfully on a runway every, after every mission. So we need to really think through what we're doing and, and take advantage of the total capability of the country and take advantage of our international relationships with these other partners. And uh, I think we can do a great deal more than we're doing today. Thank you. Hi, George. Uh, my question has to do with risk management and ultimately the decision to fly with some amount of residual risk. So you had uh, characterized um, the apprehensiveness of moving on to the next stage and, and launching. My question is, if you're gonna, if you could characterize how, to, how you got comfortable with whatever the residual risk was that ultimately was flown with on the Apollos, and, and then I know you have some of the ex same experience with shuttle, how would you characterize the residual risk that was taken in those programs, and then what advice or guidance would you give to the commercial companies making these two of the three capsules? <coughs> it has to do with this, how, how do you decide when good enough is good enough and ultimately launch with some amount of residual risk? The question is about residual risk. How do you decide when enough is enough? You've reduced risk as much as you can, and you have to accept whatever risk is remaining and, and move forward. How do, you, how do you decide to do that, and how would you counsel the commercial providers on how to move forward? Well, I think you, uh, if you look back on all our programs, uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, and space station, we've tried to do that and minimize the risk and uh, understand the risk and make sure you've tested and proven your systems to the best of your abilities. Uh, but as you get, as you say, there's still gonna be a residual risk and that's gonna come anytime I think you fly on a vehicle with uh, the energy capability of a rocket that's pretty explosive and uh, that risk is gonna always be there. But you try to work as best you can uh, to the best of your abilities to make sure that the risk is a minimum risk and that you've got some backups and capability. <coughs> and you, uh, you're you still left, left with that risk, but you have minimized it. And uh, you're always gonna fly with that risk there. Any, any specific uh, lessons learned from the experience that you <coughs> obviously had to deal with after the fire? The question is, do you have, did you, can you, can you give the commercial providers or future people that, that build rockets and fly any lessons learned about residual risk? How do you, how do you decide when it's, when it's 
the risk has been reduced as much as you can reduce it? Well, if you look at, look at the, the way we have done things and the way we do things on a program like uh, Apollo, like we have done them on Space Shuttle, uh, we do a lot of testing and we do a lot of proving of systems and there are no shortcuts. And uh, unfortunately, commercial companies who are interested in making money are going to always be looking for something that's going to reduce the cost. And I think if you're going to do that, uh, you're going to have problems. And when you fly humans, uh, those are problems that you don't want to have and uh, you can't tolerate. So I think for any of these commercial companies, they need to <clears throat> look back at how and why we did the things we were doing and uh, don't have a reason for changing unless there's a very good reason and you can prove that it's uh, acceptable the right by making the change. But uh, usually every, every, every uh, process and system that we have, we evolved because we had a problem and uh, we had a failure and we learned a lesson. And uh, we learned a hard way, but I found as I, uh, because I did work on multiple programs, I found that uh, when I got involved in space station design and I got into uh, reworking or redesigning the space station, I found that we were, our, the engineers were making the same mistakes that we'd made in Apollo 20 years before mm -hmm. because that knowledge hadn't been carried over and uh, you can't afford to do that. And uh, the, the, the knowledge of the people you have uh, needs to carry over to these, young, these new companies and carry over to that workforce. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really unfortunate, like when you cancel the shuttle, you had a very competent workforce in Florida that had done the testing and check out of the shuttles. They knew it and they were at the top of their game and they were as professional and as good as you can get. Yeah. They knew their business and did it well. And then instantaneously, we canceled the shuttle and did away with that whole workforce. You can't afford to do that because that, the knowledge that was resident in that workforce, that went all the way back to Mercury, and you can't afford that. And uh, we've made some mistakes in uh, the way we've done things, and that was one of the major mistakes. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. I really appreciate your, um, I really appreciate your leadership and humility that you've come to the table with. You talked about this, these capsules, and I'm sure having worked for major oil companies and people that have worked for major corporations, you get to this point where decisions have been made and there's momentum and money behind it, and it's somebody's pet project, like the capsules. Did you have a chance at NASA to have that, oper or have that challenge where you had a situation where it was the emperor's no clothes and you were able to you know, shut it down or get people aligned like you did with the face-to-face -face meetings? Did you have any major challenges like that where you got a program that shouldn't go forward to be shut down? And if so, what leadership uh, learnings do you have from that? Yeah, that's a good question. I want to hear the answer to that. The, the, the question is uh, analogous with the emperor's new clothes. Did you ever have experience with a program that was moving forward and you knew it was not the right thing to do, and you had the opportunity to redirect or even terminate it and, and do the right thing in NASA. And, and did you have any lessons learned from trying to do that or succeeding to do that? Yes. <laughs> there, you yeah, there you go. Read the book, I guess, huh? Yes. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> no, I, I think the uh, X-33 was probably a good example of that. And, uh, the X-33 was a program that was going to do all these things and have this wonderful capability. And if you understood physics, there was no way it could fly. And uh, the NASA and the U.S. government put a lot of money into the X-33. And uh, the, uh, Academy of Engineering said it wasn't going to fly. And uh, 
that NASA spent the money in. So when I was asked to work on it and put the Johnson Space Center to work on it, I refused to do that and didn't do that. I said I had enough work to do with the shuttle and the space station, and uh, I didn't want to take on another task uh, because we were we had plenty to do, and I didn't want to take on a task that I knew was going nowhere. And so I didn't take it on, and I gave it to another center. And then the program suddenly ran out of money, and they concluded it wasn't going to fly anyhow. So they. NASA lost all those billions they put into it. But I didn't work on it, and I was just, uh, it was unfortunate that NASA did. Okay. Yes, sir. We've had a nice chat session, and you've made some insightful observational perspectives available to the audience. We might talk a little bit about the other half of your life. I was in the Soviet Union when Belenko borrowed the airplane and found himself in Japan. <clears throat> Simply put, you were held in the highest regard of any American involved in the space program. So you might walk us through the three stages. When you were adversaries, when you started doing the first mating exercises, followed by the space station, followed by what you're doing with Bauman University at the moment. Four pieces. <laughs> or one big piece. It's, it's a four-part question, but it really relates to our evolving relationship with the former Soviet Union and the, the current Russians. How did we go from being adversaries to being uh, collaborators with the intermediate steps uh, in between? And, and uh, what, did you, what were your perspectives along the way? But, but to amplify that slightly, I was, uh, that's... his personal relationships with astronauts who happen to be cosmonauts who've gone around the world seven times, five times, is unique. There is no other American that holds a candle to him. So it relates, again, to your, your personal relationship with, with uh, Russian and former Soviet cosmonauts, and I think the perspective that that, that gives you in, in, uh, in encouraging future collaborations. Well, I think uh, back in the early 19... 90s, uh, at the time we were redesigning the space station, Russia was flying the Mirror space station, and uh, they were able to do a lot of experiments on board the Mirror space station, the life science experiments that we wouldn't have the capability to uh, redo really for a number of years uh, because the International Space Station was a long ways from being developed. And uh, so I suggested we do a program with the Russians and uh, uh, fly the shuttle to the mirror and uh, start working with the Russians and uh, start taking advantage of the mirror space station if the Russians would be agreeable to it so we could start doing experiments probably 10 years in advance of what we would do on the International Space Station. and. Uh, the Russians at that time were uh, very amenable to working with us because uh, they had uh, just had gone through the transition from the Soviet Union to uh, becoming a separate country, and, the, uh, and uh, all the other groups had broken away from the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, I met with, had an opportunity to meet with. Uh, head of the Russian uh, Space Agency uh, and uh, Roscosmos and uh, talked to him directly about working together on Space Station and going to the mirror. And uh, he said, uh, well, we already have got our Space Station. We've done our Space Station. He said, we don't want to really spend time doing that. But he said, would you go to, the, go to Mars and the moon with us? And I said, yes, we will. And so he said, if you do that, we'll work with you on the space station. And so <laughs> we ended up joining together with him on the space station and uh, laying out a program for 10 missions to the mirror. And uh, in the course of that experience, uh, working with my uh, Russian colleagues, uh, 
I got to know them very well and got to know the, uh, uh, the leadership at Star City and uh, General Yuri Glaskov, who was uh, the deputy commander at uh, Star City and uh, at the Gagarin uh, Cosmonaut Training Center, and uh, developed a great friendship with them and a uh, great friendship with a number of the cosmonauts and also with uh, a number of the engineers. And, uh, that I think has worked out very well because uh, Russians have been great partners for us on the International Space Station. And uh, we wouldn't have a space station today flying if we're not for Russia. And for the last eight years, they've taken our astronauts up to the International Space Station. And uh, that's been a bargain. People talk about what it costs us to fly with the Russians. Well, the Russians not only take our astronauts up, but they leave a spacecraft up there for six months. The Soyuz spacecraft is up there for six months to provide a, an entry for our astronauts if we have an emergency or a problem. So you're not only getting a ride up, you're getting a rescue, rescue spacecraft there that's kept there for six months, and then they bring our astronauts back. And that's a bargain. You wouldn't be able to get an, an American company to do it at that price, what the Russians are doing it for. And they've been very good partners, and uh, I hope we can continue to work with them. We do a program here at the uh, Baker Institute, an exchange program that uh, I instituted where we send uh, students from Rice and a number of universities here in the United States over to uh, Bauman University, Bauman Moscow Technical State University in Moscow for a program they do in the summer and then the Russian students come here in the spring. And we've been doing that for the last nine years and that's been a life-changing experience for students from the United States going to Russia and visiting with them and learning about the Russian space program. And it's been a life-changing experience for the students coming here from Russia. And uh, that's a program uh, that we've uh, been able to finance with private donations, and uh, unfortunately, we're, we're uh, suffering from not having enough money to continue it. But I hope we can, because it's uh, really provided a basis for those young people who eventually go into the space program to really understand uh, international activities and international relationships and the importance of that, and <clears> the <throat> importance of working together. And over the last nine years, uh, it's developed a great network of uh, young engineers and scientists in Russia and here in the United States that are dedicated to working together. And uh, I'm hopeful we can continue that program in the future. And Um, and since I'm the Hollywood guy and Al Schill, I would say that anybody who uh, wishes to make donations or knows of a potential benefactor should apply here to the uh, Baker Institute and, and Mr. Abbey and perhaps expedite some uh, 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 continuation of that program. I thought you were going to say make the checks payable to Mike Cassett. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much thank money right now. It's <laughs> thank you for saying that. He's, he's actually looking for a number in the order of $70,000, so it's not much. But to the audience, for those of us who are in the business, Bauman University is the counterpart of MIT. It's older than MIT. And he has had ladies who are Russians who've come in exchange programs, who graduated, gotten graduate degrees, and you can actually see them here at NASA at the Space Center. But George, we missed part of it because you sort of went to mirror. When was the first docking? with the Americans and Russians is a long time before Muir. Well, 1975. Yeah. Apollo Soyuz, yeah. Well, I mean, we sort of skipped that as if, you know, we, we were just going by and mated with them in order to find out if they had any caviar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no sooner had the uh, lunar landing goal been accomplished than it seemed uh, the, the geopolitical drive uh, became a, a geopolitical drive to cooperate, to collaborate, because it, it, if you think about it, the, the joint work in space has pretty much dominated the entire space age, except for the first decade when we were competitors. Well, we, if you look back, we landed on the moon in 1969, 
George Lowe had moved up to become the deputy administrator of NASA, and he started a program working with the Russians in 1970. And when he visited Moscow, he suggested uh, doing a joint mission with the Russians and uh, really came up with the Apollo Soyuz program and got uh, Bob Gilruth to take a team of engineers over to Moscow and laid out uh, a program, a way of coming up with a do common docking system that would enable the United States to rescue Russian cosmonauts and uh, Russia to Amer rescue American cosmonauts or American astronauts and uh, would have a common docking system. And we did develop that together, uh, the two nations and uh, engineers and, and uh, cosmonauts and astronauts from both countries and flew a very successful mission in July 1975. And, uh, we found as we uh, started working again with Russia in, 19, in the 1990s that that, uh, that really provided a foundation for what we have been doing now with the International Space Station and working with the Russians because uh, they remembered that, uh, remembered that very well and uh, they uh, appreciated having uh, worked together in, back in 75 and felt it was important to continue that, and uh, that was a good foundation for what we're doing today. Translated, uh, we're talking about your personal relationship for over four decades. Thank you. And I think it's, it's worth noting that perhaps Mr. Abbey also should get credit for, for a a pattern that has repeated since the, the 70s, and that is when there are joint meetings between the US and the Russian teams on whatever the topic, it seems like we meet in Moscow in the winter and we meet in Houston in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Yes, uh, if a company has a new technology that they would like to present to NASA, what division or what uh, department would they contact? Uh, we've found that the uh, the private companies don't want to uh, invest in new technologies when they've spent so much already on 60-year-old uh, rocket technology. They don't want to do something disruptive because they are already engaged in the present uh, rocket technology. Is there a department in NASA that's willing to look at new technologies? The, the question relates to the fact that uh, there may be disruptive technologies out there, especially in rocketry and propulsion that NASA is reluctant to hear about. Is there somebody at NASA that, that a, a proposer or developer can go to and, and get a fair hearing for a disruptive technology? I would, I would hope so. I think uh, there are certainly engineers at NASA that would be receptive to that, yes. But it's difficult to get a hold of them. We've called and called. And there's, a, there's actually a, a, a part of NASA that's called NIAC, and it's the NASA Innovative something something. I forget what the A and the C stand for. But they actually do seek out disruptive technologies. They're the ones that have funded studies of warp drive and hibernation and, and things that are things like that. So and I think there is a possibility, and we can probably, Mr. Abbey, I will volunteer Mr. Abbey to help you find out who they are. Well, yeah, what, because, what center are they at? Yes. There's, there, it's out of headquarters. Okay. They're where? NASA headquarters. headquarters. Not okay, at. because sometimes they're all over the country. Yeah. We keep yeah. getting calls or answers. We'll call another one. We call another one. That's not us. It's another one. Yeah. So okay. that, that's, that happens, and I, I'm guilty of that as well when, when I was a okay. civil servant. All right. There's always you. somebody else that's better suited to answer that question. I think we've gotten the high sign. It's time to wrap that up. I'd like to leave you with one final analogy from my own personal perspective working uh, at, uh, with Mr. Abbey. I've only done that a few times in my career. But STS-63, the first rendezvous flight, Jim Weatherby was the commander, and we had, uh, was it, I think it was uh, Sergei Krikalov on board as well. Yes. The first test flight of rendezvousing uh, the, the space shuttle with the Mir without docking because the shuttle did not have the docking system. But we were preparing for the, the flights that he had mentioned where we were going to have joint docking flights, uh, joint, joint docking missions with the, the Russians and leaving an American astronaut on the Russian space station Mir. We had decided, the scientific community decided that there was pre-positioning required to get experiments on board the Mir in, in advance of the first docking mission, and we didn't know how to do that. And, we, and Mr. Abbey brought up the fact that we were going to be rendezvousing 
with them, that is getting within 100 meters or 10 meters of the Russian space station. And we said, yes, Mr. Abbey, but that's not a docking. There's no way to actually transfer equipment across that gap. And he says, we've done harder things. <laughs> and you have to remember that, that he and his colleagues had done the hardest things possible. So it was really kind of hard for us to turn, our, you know, turn around and say, well, you can't do that anymore. But that was, that was a bit of a, an eye-opening experience and a, and a, and a frame-setting experience for, for me in, in my career. So uh, with, with that, uh, I'm going to take the, the prerogative of saying that's the final word for this, uh, this presentation. I want to thank uh, Mike Cassett and Mr. Abbey for the opportunity to sit on the same stage and talk with them yeah. for this event. Thank you. And